Welcome to Voices from the Bench, a dental laboratory podcast. Send us an email at info at voicesfromthebench.com or look for us on Facebook at Voices from the Bench. Greetings and welcome to episode number 30 of Voices from the Bench. My name is Elvis Dahl. And you know that my name is Barbara Wojan. But we can't believe that we made it to episode 30. And we still get along. We're not divorced yet. I can't believe it. It's pretty amazing that we can even get one episode done, let alone 30. I'm pretty impressed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a partnership made in heaven. I'm so grateful. So tell me, Barb, do you guys do RPD frameworks at Night Dental? Um, no. We actually used to have a department, but unfortunately, we're not doing them anymore. So we do do some digital, and the ones that we do yeah, digital, yeah. we work with an outsourced lab here in Florida that does it for us. Why did you guys stop doing it? Was it because the technicians were hard to find or the business wasn't there? Everybody's getting implants? Um, well, we did a lot of lab-to-lab business, and there's not a lot of margins in lab-to-lab business because you don't make a whole lot of money on them, and the labor's high. And it was just a, a better business decision to uh, for us to um, close it down. So Yeah. We actually have a guy that rents space from us at our lab that does not only our RPD frameworks, but he also does ones for other accounts. And it's actually a nice little setup. I mean, we get one flat fee and he pays us rent, so it works out. Awesome. I think there's a, a huge business for it. Um, it's just not, you know, for us, but it definitely is for our guests today, and we can't wait to bring them to you. Absolutely. So this week, we are starting a new interview with a married couple that own a removable lab that specializes in RPDs. So that's something you don't hear very often. So to help me introduce them, I asked Vaughn Grow, a guy who we interviewed on here a few months ago, to introduce them. Vaughn? Nas Incorporated. Aw, that's cool. So joining us today is Jeremiah, who's a CDT and a DTG, and Amanda Noss from, and excuse me as I mispronounce it, Inverness. I think I got it. Oh, you you pronounced it correctly from this Florida girl. (laughs) Well done. Amanda Noss from Inverness Dental Arts down in Florida with you, Barb. Are you close to them? How far away are you? Uh, I think we're like an hour and a half, maybe two hours away. I, I, I would love to nice. take a trip down there, actually. We're now you Facebook should. friends. And uh, ever since we interviewed them, I've been following them on Facebook and watching their pictures and all the things that they do. I think you have been, too. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's pretty interesting. We sat down with them and talked about how they got into the business how their lab grew into be what it is today, all while maintaining a balanced work-home married life, which is an interesting tale. So join us as we talk with the Noss family. Roll it. Voices from the Bench. The interview. I want to welcome Jeremiah and Amanda Noss. Jeremiah is a CDT and a DTG, which is the Dental Technicians Guild, with the Vaughn Group, who we had on a while ago. And Jeremiah and Amanda are out of Florida, down there with you, Barb, Cool. at Inverness Dental Lab, which is interesting because here's a married couple that work together (laughs) and are able to successfully work together because the thought of me working with my wife scares the bejeebies (laughs) out of me. I can say that freely because she doesn't listen to the show. So welcome, Jeremiah and Amanda. How are you guys today? Good. Hello. <laughs> well, thank you for having us here. Yeah, we're doing pretty good. We're, uh, you know, you bring up an interesting thing about working together. and It has its challenges. <laughs> I would imagine. So let's do a little history. You know, I know we don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but how did your guys' dental lab come to be? Well, I was pretty much raised in the industry. Uh, my mother was a ceramist. I worked for some kind of high-end people that decided to start her own career. So she did. She opened up a a laboratory in the shed of the property that we were living in at the time. And I was pretty young. I don't really honestly remember how young I was. Just, you know, baby, baby. Yeah. Um, And my dad actually at the time was a uh, foreman for a construction company down in Orlando area. And uh, he ended up getting kind of sick contracting some of this some, some sort of rare thing that had to get, get, kind of get taken care of and did, but uh, kind of kicked him out of the world of construction. And my dad is more of, let's say, the business-minded aspect, and where my uh-huh. mother is more of the artistic-minded. 
So they decided to kind of join forces and uh, they opened up their own laboratory on their property. My dad kind of ran the business aspects of things and my, and my mother did all the uh, technician work. Out of a shed. Out of a shed. Yeah, it was oh. an old, uh, just kind of a shed that they kind of converted into a small laboratory and it was right there on the property. I mean, I used to earn my allowance by filling up plaster bins and cleaning the lab and, you know, pouring impressions and just doing whatever crap they didn't want to do. So you're basically um, second generation as well, because I grew up the same way. My dad uh, started from the ground up and I basically was born and raised in the lab. And it's pretty neat because a lot of our podcasts, most every single person that we've interviewed has fallen into this by a family member, you know, aunt, uncle. You know, it's it's pretty neat to hear each other's stories. So I echo that. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's one of those things where I think we hear that because there's not a lot of education of what we do out there to the general public. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of the people that are continuing in this industry know about, you know, it. <laughs> know about it, heard about it, or just were involved about it, some sort of family aspect. So mm -hmm. we find it's pretty common. The uh, family kind of just did that for a long time. And jump forward many, many, many years after I decided to quit college and come back and join into the family laboratory aspect again. I never wanted, never saw myself building porcelain. It's not who I was, it's not what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So I had talked to my father about opening up a removable division for our laboratory and he liked it. So I quit college and uh, flew up to Rhode Island at the time. Or was it Chicago? I think it was Chicago. When Austin All was kind of their own entity and trained from up there on how to make RPDs. Wow! And that was kind of the that was the start of me going into the laboratory full time. And then, God, twelve years later, however many years later, um, me and my wife decided to go ahead and buy the business and make all kinds of changes. <laughs> <laughs> So, so Amanda, are you a technician as well, or are you the business-minded one? I'm the business-minded one. I was brought in originally when we had our first son, Jack. His dad kind of wanted to step away, and he figured I could take over his responsibilities. So it started off small. I just started with answering phones, doing billing, checking in cases, that kind of stuff. And then quickly, within about six months or so, he had pretty much turned over the bills, the payroll, the business side of the business. Mm -hmm. And we just kind of went from there. Um, anything that they could teach me in the lab, they did. Um, I did run into issues with my eyesight. I had cataracts mm -hmm. really bad. Wow. And so what I got taught was a lot of procedural stuff here. Let me show you how to pour this impression or um, scan this model. And I filled in uh, uh -huh. otherwise. Yeah. But I don't really call myself a technician because I kind of um, stayed really in the support aspect of the business. But it sounds like you know enough to be dangerous. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was going to say all of us technicians need that business mind. Uh, you know, we're very, we're artists. And um, so I, I'm sure you guys are very successful together with both of those pieces. It takes a balance. It takes me kind of backing off and letting her do what I know that she needs to do and vice versa for her. So, you know, we do, we've been successful respecting each other's positions and kind of just following suit, you know, just listening to what the other person wants us to do, realizing that they have the knowledge for what they're saying. And, you know, we seem to kind of come together pretty well like that. <laughs> I would say so. <laughs> yeah. Respecting each other's strength is important. Exactly. And well, probably I, hard I, to um, do. Very early on, I realized managing his time was our biggest um, commodity. You know, our biggest uh, mm -hmm. you know, expense was him and, you know, watching him go, what am I supposed to work on next? And realizing all of the time that that took away from him. And so very quickly it became, you know, well, if I can set him up for whatever he needs to work on next, then that's less time he's wasting, you know, trying to figure this situation out. And it was a process of trusting each other, I think, you know, where I would hand him something and he'd go, are you sure? Like, this is, you know, like, this is what he's working on. <laughs> and they'd be like, yes, you know. And, and then there were also, you know, we encountered issues too where I would hand him stuff and not comprehend what I was asking for and the time frame. <laughs> yeah. So mm -hmm. we had, no pressure. We had to work through that. <laughs> right. Exactly. I would hand him something and be like, Hey, I need this in two hours. And 
he would go, you have no idea what you've just asked. (laughs) (laughs) And so, yeah, I was learning, learning that, learning the uh, steps of all of the things that needed to be done in removables because, um, you know, Crown and Bridge usually gets a little bit more time, I think, than removable labs as far as turnaround and in cases and stuff. absolutely yep yeah i would so, agree so there is that juggling aspect that i think we had to go through for the probably the first six months or yeah. so <laughs> so are you guys only a removable lab yeah, yeah. Uh, right now we are only a removable laboratory as you kind of probably got from some of the glimpses of what we've said previously already the laboratory used to be a full service laboratory yeah bridge and removable and the, the really short of the really long of that one is that I was uh, unhappy as a person and as a technician trying to manage both aspects of the industry, hmm. um, especially mm-hmm. being someone who does not build porcelain and someone that doesn't, you know, hasn't mastered or at least become qualified in the every aspect of the Cranerbridge world to properly manage. It became a, a overwhelmingly stressful situation that we quickly realized it needed to stop. Um, <laughs> so we actually uh, decided to stop doing Craner Bridge completely and uh, sold everything. I mean, we were you know, CAD cam, you know, ready. We had 3D printers. We had scanners. Really? Oh, yeah. Uh, pressing ovens. We did it all. And uh, we just uh, we decided to get rid of all of it, sold it for pennies on the dollar just mm-hmm. just to try to just to try to live a different life. So we had currently, yes, we only do removables, partials, dentures, you know, hybrids, bars, you know, things like that. We made the decision at Night Dental to close that part of our laboratory down too. You know, I know what you're talking about when you say better quality of life, because you're basically living enough hours at the laboratory, but it can be so stressful and all of the time constraints that we have and the pressure, 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 I'm sure that that was an excellent decision for you guys. Yeah, you know, it was a very scary decision. Yeah. Very scary. <laughs> I, mean, I could talk about that for quite some time, but it was ultimately a, a change in life that we felt needed to happen, but also needed to take a step back and be sure that it, it financially could happen. Yeah. And that we weren't really kind of cutting off our nose in spite of our face, just trying to make an idea work. Yeah, I imagine shutting down Crown and Bridge or Fixed uh, really put a damper on sales rather quickly. Well, you know, honestly, you know, growing up in the lab, being open and exposed to the billing aspects of all this, Mm -hmm. every month, one of the things my father would always do would kind of analyze the sales of the month, and he'd always bring up these charts and graphs. And I used to always see a, a definitive difference between the amount of credit and bridge sales and the amount of removable sales percentage wise that was going on. Sure. And I remember as a kid, if I could hit 15 to 16 percent of my lab sales in removables, I felt like I was really doing great. <laughs> and as time went on, all the way up to the point we sold it, where, you know, when we did sell it, our lab was almost sixty-five to seventy percent removable sales. Wow! And you know, you know, the rest being Crown and Bridge, we found that removable want was just climbing and climbing and climbing, and we were able to uh, recognize that, I guess, and allow that to be a big uh, influence on supporting our decision to just go removables. Our Crown and Bridge lab also got hit hard in that two thousand and eight. Oh, yeah. You know, hit that everybody, I think, took. And um, rather than growth, which was what the lab had seen for many years prior, we were actually cutting prices to try to even stay in the market. And and I, I know that that's, that was a lot of labs during that time. And sure. so like Jeremiah said, that flip occurred where all of a sudden the removable work started dominating the sales aspect of the lab and um so when that time came to make that decision i think it just it kind of presented itself as the obvious choice but it was so scary (laughs) yeah timing seemed to work out almost in your favor it it did you know had it not been for all the stars lining up and allowing us to do this um, I probably wouldn't be a dental technician right now. Um, I was that unhappy with, with with the life that I was living and the emotional state that I was constantly mm-hmm. in 
that I really kind of quickly realized that I'd almost go down to Tampa and be a shrimper or something. I mean, it's just <laughs> a little bit different. I mean, or stock shelves at Walmart. I mean, with an yeah, actual, yeah. you know, benefits. <laughs> um, yeah. So I had to change it, it. You know, it had to happen. My laboratory, we do some removable, but it's definitely not what we excel at. And the one thing that I know industry wide is the, you know, lack of um, removable technicians and, you know, the lack of training for it. So I'm sure if you just specialize at it, especially in Florida, where there's so many doctors, you guys are probably doing a really, really, really great job. And so many old people. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, you, know, you, would, you, know, <laughs> you would think so, but I will say from the years of studying and kind of the demographics of different areas. You know, the southwest part of all the states in the United States really is some of the the lowest charging lab fees out yeah. there. And Sappy. so we really found that we really able to exceed and start honestly charging what we wanted to charge for our mm -hmm. products by acquiring out-of-state work. Nice. That's been a big, huge influencer for us is just charging what we feel is an appropriate an amount and finding the clientele that's really willing to pay that amount. We aren't cheap by any means. And so because of that, a lot of our local work that is all insurance based mm -hmm. is kind of the doctors aren't willing to kind of pay what it takes to, to do what we, you know, what we want to do. Sure. Yeah. Interesting. So that was the past. Let's look at the present. Where are you guys at now? How many employees do you have? Or is it just you two? <laughs> we have one. <laughs> We have, we have one. We have me, one. It's me. Yeah. You know, one guy, me and my wife, and a, a guy named Jonathan. We have two retired um, gentlemen that drive nice. for us. Yeah. We, yeah. When we closed the Crown and Bridge Lab, we honestly did not need both of them. We had two vehicles and we had two drivers. We used to run mm -hmm. a, you know, a morning north route and then an afternoon southern route. And when we uh, shut down that side of the lab, we didn't need them. And we went to them and said, hey, you know, we don't want to fire either one of you, but we don't really need both of you. So whichever one of you doesn't want to work, um, <laughs> you know, just let us know. And they came back and said that they did not want to quit and that they would both continue working wow. for us. <laughs> so, yeah, it works out nice. They cover each other's vacations. Um, yeah, we're very protective of our little old men drivers that we love. Sure, we all are. <laughs> they are the face of our company. But other than that, we only have one guy, John, works for us. So Yeah, I mean, and for for quite some time after we purchased the laboratory from my parents and made that decision, we worked by ourselves for about six to eight months. And John came about, honestly, because I got so tired of polishing crap and investing things <laughs> and spending my time away from setting teeth and designing frameworks that uh, it just became obvious that, you know, hiring someone was the uh, was the right thing to do. Yeah, to keep your sanity, sure. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to, but we did. And he's been great. <laughs> yeah, we all want to do everything. And that's why you become burnout and stressful because, you know, it's a, we love it and we're so passionate about it. And we want, you know, we're kind of a little bit controlling. Technicians? But, you know, good for you that I, decision. Yeah, that's, yeah I, mean, I mean, that's the nice way of saying it. I, I'm a little more blunt where I just, I don't like employees. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I have very unrealistic expectations of what an employee should yep. be. Sure. And because I, knew, I mean, I just expect employees to treat my business as I would. And I know that's unrealistic. So it makes my dealing with employees difficult. So this one's been great. We've had some ups and downs, but he really is. We kind of think of him a lot more as a, just a family member, much more than just an employee. Well, that's nice. And I'm sure he's the employee that you you, know, you were striving to find. That probably really does give two shits about your business. Sorry, I should. We have to eliminate my cussing. An employee that actually cares about oh. your business and about it as much as you do. So you'll probably keep him for a long, long time. We will, you know, as we'll probably talk further in the uh, podcast, uh, he has actually made the uh, the verbal agreement at this point to follow our career over to the Oregon area for some of our future adventures. He uh, kind of plans on going with us. Oh, over. my God. Really? That's awesome. Yeah. Wow. I love it out there. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Good for you guys. I would segue into that, but I want to hold off for a little bit. Yes, yeah. <laughs> what is Irvinus Dental Lab known for? What do you guys it's specialize in? Inverness. Say that again. 
What? Did I say it wrong? Inverness. Yeah. Inverness. Where does that come from? It's Scottish, believe it or not. There's a town in um, Scotland that's named Inverness, and Inverness itself was settled by Scottish settlers. So that's why that's where we got our name. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry I keep butchering it, <laughs> no, but that's okay. what I do on Get the used podcast. To it. <laughs> yeah, I do it well. You know, I think if you asked the the majority of people that know us, they would say that we specialize in in RPDs. Mm-hmm. I, you know, that's happened a lot because I've been asked to do a lot of lecturing lately and a lot of table mix on the RPD world, which is a whole other conversation about the lack of education in that in, in that part of our industry. But I would like to say that I've. Uh, hell, I don't know. I guess I got more confidence in my RPD world than I do anything, but I really love full dentures and really kind of get into the composite work a lot more than other things. Mm. But I would say we're more well known for our RPDs than anything. Do you make frames? <laughs> do you make frames? Yeah, that's what Is we that hear the question. So. Yeah. It seems to be a very, uh, a very, very big void in that aspect of our industry that I guess we seem to fill. To a, you know, a very small degree. I mean, we're not we're not producing any type of mass volume of frameworks. So it is a part of our industry that harder and harder to find people to do them. And a lot of labs, even big labs, you hear about them outsourcing their frameworks just because finding someone to do it full time is tough. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure why there's so few of us doing it that really. You know, if I, if I just want to be honest with my I guess myself and other people that are doing it, there's no reason for us, RPD people at least, to be fighting for the bottom at all. I mean, we should, we you know, we're not terribly cheap, and we kind of feel like everyone else is should be raising their prices also. We encourage our local labs close to us to continue to raise their prices. Yeah. <laughs> because if they raise theirs, then that means we can raise ours. It's kind of one of those things like, you know, um, rather than fight for the bottom, why don't we all just improve our quality and get better money all around? There's a lot of truth in that. Yeah, I think, you know, I had my eyes opened up to an issue a little while ago, and I'll just try to hit on it really quick about maybe a – a strong influence on why RPDs are accepted in a low quality aspect. And that is we were asked by a local university lab to do their frameworks for them and come to find out, I think that university was only allowing the laboratory to charge them $75 $75 for that framework. Wow. And so for me, that $75 framework is what all these new dentists are going to be exposed to and told is the accepted norm. That is cheap. Yeah, it really is. And, you know, and really what kind of quality can really be there for that kind of price? And that's, you know, that's what is being upcharged. You figure the lab probably didn't pay 50 or 60 bucks for it. So they could make $10 off of it, you know, at least to the university. Yeah. yeah. So having our doctors be exposed to that level of work coming out of school, they just come out of school and that's what they go look for. And so they, absolutely, I have to almost, almost have to teach some of these dentists why we charge what we charge and why it holds the value that it holds. How many of the frameworks that you make that the doctor surveys or how many of them percentage wise do they ask you to survey? I would honestly say that, I want to think about this number before I'm, uh, I, I spit it out. Sure. I would say 100% of our clients <laughs> might, well, 100% give me full control over the realistic world of designing that frame. Nice. Yeah. They might send me their theory or their proposed idea on a wanted design. But if I survey it out and I tell them that's going to have impinging the tissue or it's going to impinge the cheek, they're always, not always, but they're more than willing to respect my thoughts on that and understand that's worth trying at least. Leave it to the experts. Yep. I just thought since a lab specialize in RPDs, because, you know, we don't specialize in it, but 99% of the time we just get told to make an upper <laughs> and that's it. Yeah, you know, it's a big fight of mine without trying to get into preaching about it too much because I can easily do that. I think the definition of an RPD in our removable world has gotten skewed. And 
everyone's kind of forgotten what an RPD truly is. And really, we say RPD, if we just talk about framework and the word framework and got rid of the removable industry, and we talked about frameworks to kind of rich people, they would always tell you that that framework is there to only support and give structure to the end result, which is the porcelain. So for us, um, the RPD is something that is just a support structure for missing teeth which is the goal. You know, these people that fabricate frameworks without any consideration of what the end result needs to look like first needs to maybe reevaluate why they're making what they're making. That makes a lot of sense. So like I said, I don't want to ramble on about that forever because I could, but sure. I mean, that's the value in our frameworks is I try to phrase it like that, that our frameworks really are Nothing more than a support structure for the teeth. Yeah. You know, the framework is not what the patient wants to see. The, the patient wants to see their missing teeth replaced beautifully. They could honestly care less about some awesome looking design framework. As long as it fits their mental requirements um, for fit and lightweight and user friendly, they really care about what those missing teeth look like more than what they care about what that frame looks like. Yeah, they're not like, woo, hot damn, look at this metal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, just, <laughs> you just don't hear that. I mean, I mean, I say that in my lectures that, I mean, for as many patients as, I, as I've seen to your side, I've never heard one in my life look at their framework and go, wow, man, you did a real bad <laughs> job on this metal. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, look how shiny yeah, that is. Exactly. You don't hear that. I mean, you hear complaints like it doesn't fit well or it hurts. They're still, they want to see their missing teeth replaced. A good frame should disappear. It should let the teeth do the talking at that point, in, in our opinion. Our frame should not be the focal point of what you see when you when they put it in their mouth. We want them to see their teeth. You know, that's what they're wanting to see. Yep, exactly. Absolutely. That's a really good way to look at it. Let me ask, how did you get into lecturing? And um, like, was that something you always wanted to do? Was that something that, you know, was a personal hurdle for you or that you just felt passionate about sharing your knowledge? Because I know uh, getting up on the podium and, you know, lecturing, it takes a lot of guts. You know, I've done it a couple of times and I was just curious if that's a passion for you or how'd you get in that? I think it's becoming a little bit of a passion only because I'm seeing what kind of lack of true education is out there for RPDs. Mm -hmm. I honestly can't think of one single course that's been given in the past 12 months that involves RPDs at all. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, it's true. That, that, that aspect is kind of opening up my eyes to the want for the education out there. Mm -hmm. But to be honest with you, starting off, no, it was it was some scary crap for me. Yeah, <laughs> I never really, I fumble up and stutter. And I mean, I'm not the best speaker in the world. He's a great speaker. I was going to say, Amanda, do you go with him? I bet you do for moral support. <laughs> I do go with him. He kind of needs a handler. Yep. So I, you know, rodeo him to the places most of the time. But he gets more compliments than criticisms. Yep. So as much as he wants to not a good speaker. I think he has um, a passion for this um, topic. And so it comes across that way when he speaks. It takes a lot of guts to get up on there. And, and uh, I've had a coach and, you know, try to get, get me up there and coach me. And, you know, it's scary as hell. So I applaud you for that, you know, facing your fear to get up there and share your knowledge and teach people how to do things the right way. I mean, that's a big deal. I think the hardest thing for me every time I do this is to limit the amount of cussing that comes out of my mouth. <laughs> me too. That, that's about the hardest thing is I tend to even tell people that, you know, I'm a technician, so I'm going to speak to you as if you were a technician also yep. and there comes a lot of four-letter words with that talk um so i try to back off i have a problem elvis has to bleep me out and um, some people don't appreciate it but you know what i just think that's kind of how we talk i'm good bad or indifference you know it's not all that bad but every every once in a while that's really the only word that has meaning when you're speaking yeah for me it's just that, you know my mouth usually speaks faster than my what my mind can uh, back it off from. Yeah. So it's just, you know, I know I shouldn't say it, but before I realize that, I've already said it. Yep. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, why do you think I hide behind the podcast with the nice <laughs> edible software? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so what sort of things do you cover now? 
A big thanks to Jeremiah and Amanda Noss for sharing their story with us. If you haven't seen any of Jeremiah's work, head over to Facebook and look up Inverness Dental Arts or Dental Technician Skills. Their pages, he's always posting some awesome stuff on RPDs. They join us again next week, and we talk with Jeremiah about him speaking publicly on RPDs and an exciting career change they're looking in to do. Let's just say that they want to do something that's not really legal in their state. So join us next week. So don't forget to head over to NADL.org and register for the Vision 21 meeting, which is January 16th to the 19th of uh, early next year. A great meeting put out by the NADL with Barb and I recording live. Anyone willing to sit down and chat with us, we're looking forward to it. Yes, we are, and hopefully we'll have plenty of uh, bleeps and errors, and, you know, anything can happen live. We learned that uh, a couple weeks ago <laughs> when we did Wire Wednesday, and that was pretty cool, but we enjoyed it. I think we did pretty well. Just kind of go with the flow, which is something we are very good at. Yes, head over to VoicesFromTheBench.com and check out a link for the NADL and our live interview, Unplugged, at Wire Wednesday. Right. Don't forget, t-shirts are still on sale, and you can always get a raffle ticket for the motorcycle that Iva Clar has donated. All those links are at VoicesFromTheBench.com. Yeah, I saw a, uh, David Hornbrook put a picture of him on Facebook on top of the bike, or riding the bike. I shouldn't say on top of the bike. It sounds kind of sexual, but with him <laughs> sitting on the bike, and they got a ton of likes and a ton of exposure, and I think they had a lot of people that um, bought tickets, so I thought that was really, really a good thing. So thank you, David Hornbrook. All right, everybody, that's all we got for this week. We'll see you next week. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. Publicly, blah, 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 blah. <laughs>